anyways, we, we, we're excited to be here. And um, I know your pastor's brought back reports about what God is doing over there because God has used him and Pastor John uh, tremendously in our, in our church over there and in, in, in our lives. Uh, I want to say thanks to the life groups for all of your extra offerings that have continued to help pay the rent for our house. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep a roof over our heads and a, and a place we can call home. Also a place for ministry. Amen. We're also looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, Jose and Yupin coming over. Hello, somebody. Come on. All right, all right brother. He's ready. Ready? I told him, I said, you want to go to Thailand or anywhere, you need to come to, through the Philippines first because the Philippines is the gateway to Asia. So, uh, amen. So him and his wife and daughter, we're excited to have them. The church is excited. We're already getting their room prepared for them and, and so forth. Amen. Uh, their missionary room, praise the Lord. So, Eddie, <laughs> you know, told him, bro, we better pray for the mattress. Hello, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I throw that in there. Maybe some of y'all want to go ahead and sponsor a mattress for the missionaries. Amen. Okay. Oh, now you're not laughing. Okay. That wasn't funny. No, okay. Praise the Lord. Don't talk about my money because it ain't funny. Um, but we have, you know, uh, a thriving men's home and church in San Pedro. We're also overseeing the, the ministry there in Manila. And, uh, and the, the Manila ministry is starting to really take off. We have some great leaders that have released us to be here for two months. And uh, actually, the, the problems have been very minimal, which means they're solving problems. How many can say amen? Which means that it's time to kick them out of the church. Amen. It's time to start planning more churches. Amen. It's time to start planning more churches there in the Philippines. We will be going to Indonesia uh, in, to visit our church there in September to uh, bring some Filipinos with us. Amen be our first mission trip from the San Pedro church and they're excited they've gotten their passports already and they're excited to go out and go back so that next year for world conference we'll be able to try to bring some of them to the world conference hello somebody so please keep that in prayer and keep you know you know talking about it and praying for it and hopefully one of these days you all get on a plane and come on over as well amen. hello get your passport amen it was a miracle the first time I traveled the world that I even got out of the country because I had warrants. Hello, somebody. <laughs> and, I, and I left the country and came back, you know, hello. And they didn't arrest me until actually I started doing prison ministry. Then I actually took it to the next level and went to prison, stayed in prison. No, just joking. Uh, but I was arrested to clear my name, but it was funny because the same judge that saw me and sent me to the men's home in 1995 saw me in his courtroom and said, what are you doing here? Hello, somebody. Wiped my record clean, gave me the, the uh, clean name and a good, ready to travel the world. And now, you know, God is doing great things there and we're believing God for Asia. How many believe God for Asia? <laughs> Hello. We're getting emails. I'm getting emails. I told Pastor Al we're getting emails from Malaysia and Singapore, planning to try to bring Pastor Jeffrey from Indonesia to go with me over there so that we can also see what the Lord wants to do. We have some uh, people there that are Christians and used to be alcoholic, but they're, and now they're like professional sports. They're in jog, like runners in, in, in professional sports, and they're emailing and asking us to come. And uh, visit them, and they're willing to pay my way. Praise the Lord. So, who can argue with that? <laughs> Amen. Stand your feet with me, if you would. We've been here for a minute, going home next Sunday. Actually, about this time next week, we'll be at the arriving in the airport, ready to go. And I'll be ready to fall asleep. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We've been nonstop from city to city since we've been here. Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles with, to Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 9. We're here still throughout tomorrow. Oh, by the way, I didn't like announce this, but we still take cell phones and all that. If you guys want to upgrade yourself, go to the store, get your upgrade, you know, send your phones with us to the Philippines. Uh, you know, Jose and Yupin will probably need one anyways when they get there. So send your phones. Amen. Sponsor the home ministry. Praise the Lord. By the way, uh, United We Can, you know, pick it up, pick it up. If 
you're not a challenged yet, invest in world missions and you'll see what God can do in your life. Amen. Amen. He, you, you, and, I'll, and I'll touch more about that in the message. But, you know, we wouldn't be standing there in the Philippines if it wasn't for United We Can. And uh, today, because of that, we have a self-sufficient ministry. Uh, there's no more United We Can in Asia for right now. But because there's so many things taking place around the world, that Victor Outreach, we need to keep it up. Amen. amen. And we don't want our founders to be hindered because they don't have the finances. How many can say amen? amen. Ezekiel 47.9, you got it? Amen. The Bible says, wherever the stream flows, there will be all kinds of animals and fish. The stream will make the water of the Dead Sea fresh, and wherever it flows, it will bring life. Let's pray. Father, we pray for this place to be a, a river that will flow with your Holy Spirit, and that in our lives we will receive life to give life. And we thank you, Lord, that today, Lord God, we can come together and to be able to drink from the living water, and that our lives will also be a drinking well for those who are thirsty. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five. Say it's time to high five campaign. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I want to read one more verse. So if you would turn to Acts chapter 18, verse 1 through 6. Acts 18, verse 1 through 6. Because I'm going to use Paul as an example this afternoon. And if I start preaching and I say Tagalog words, forgive me. My daughter will translate for you later. <laughs> I've been here two months, but it still happens. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm Filipino in heart. Praise God. The Bible says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila a man of Pontus by race who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. He came to them and because he practiced the same trade, he lived with them and worked, for by trade they were tent makers. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit. Everybody say, by the Spirit. By the Spirit. Testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook out his clothing and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Here we see that Paul is coming to a city that he is beginning to realize that he's not comfortable in, right? Many of us, we got to realize that, you know, God is raising up a ministry such as Victory Outreach where he begins to create new creations. How many are new creations here this morning, this afternoon? And today we got to realize that no matter what, where we came from, what kind of background we have, God can begin to use your life to begin to put you in a place where you're not familiar. Hello. Amen. You're going to put you in a place where you're not really understanding the culture of the people around you. I mean, you go around Colorado Springs, there's different cultures, I'm sure, where you go from one place to the next, it's like, you know, night and day. Hello, somebody. You go right down the street from the campus, you got a whole bunch of big old houses, and then you go across the street, and then all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of other places. You see, we got to realize that Paul was in a place here, and Paul was one of the greatest missionaries that we could ever begin to understand and study. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. You see, he had an open mind and he also allowed the Holy Spirit to lead him and guide him, to be able to speak to him and to bring him to places where he, he wouldn't naturally be comfortable, but because God brought him there, God would still use him supernaturally. I remember when I first went to the mission field in Dublin, Ireland. I was just out of the home for maybe six months and I was there. And I remember that, you know, when the pastor had left and I was there and I didn't know what to do because all the church was hurt and distraught, I was there. But all of a sudden, because I was willing to let the Holy Spirit use me, God was able to put an anointing on me that was able to bring about wisdom through my lips. Hello, somebody. I barely knew very, very many scriptures because I was just out of the home. 
I didn't have the vet the training. I didn't have the Bible schooling. I didn't have the education. But how many know that it doesn't matter? All of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit comes on your life, you can sound like you got a PhD. You see, God brought Paul to the city of Corinth, and Paul was schooled by the best of teachers. Galileo, hello, somebody. He was schooled and raised up in the, in the right kind of family, the religious family, a well-provided-for family. He didn't have needs when he grew up. He was well-provided-for. Hello, somebody. He wasn't really what you would call a treasure out of darkness. So here he comes to the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth was a place where there was a lot of sin. He came there, and he seen that every night before the sun would go down, there was women who would come out, and they were priestesses. Hello, somebody. They would come to the city, down to the city from the temple of Aphrodite, and they were actually prostitutes, hello, offering themselves as a form of worship to the, te to the goddess Aphrodite. We're talking hundreds of women would do this. Then they would also have this thing where if you were known as a person from the city of Corinth, you were known as a drunkard, a loose liver. How many know what I'm talking about today? Are there any ex-alcoholics in the house? Hello. So Paul was there and he would also see all the gambling. And, and even back then they had different kinds of drugs that they would taste and, and they would experience. So he came and he got nervous. He even says in 1 Corinthians, he says, I came to you with fear and trembling. I was afraid. I was nervous. How, have you ever been in a situation where you were in a place where you felt like you were out of place? You felt like, man, I, don't, I just don't fit in here. And I don't know what to do or how to act. How many have been there before? Huh? Paul felt like, a lot like this. So he told them, listen, so I decided when I came to you not to come with these big, wise, persuasive words. Not to come with my education or all of these things. I decided to come to you through a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And through a demonstration of the Holy Spirit, I brought to you the simple gospel that Jesus died for all of our sins. And that Jesus rose again. And through Jesus now, he has called us. Hello. And he even had spoke about his, his vision on the road to Emmaus. How he had experienced and had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so this is the simple gospel that we as Victory Outreach got to understand that no matter where God sends us in the cultures around the world, God is going to start giving us favor to go ahead and go to places where, listen, you might not necessarily know what to do or what to say or how to act, but if you allow the Holy Spirit, just like Paul did, he, the Bible says that he allowed the Spirit to go ahead and come upon him, and therefore he began to preach with boldness. And even when they opposed him, the Jews, the religious people, hello somebody. Even when they opposed him and blasphemed against him, he said, all right then, shake it off. I'm going to go where God called me. You know, Paul was not supposed to be preaching to the Jews anyways. Paul was not supposed to be in the church preaching the gospel. He was supposed to be in the beer houses. Hello, somebody. He was supposed to be in, in, the, in, the, in the streets and the highways and byways preaching to the Gentiles because that's what Jesus said. I have anointed and called you to go to the Gentiles. This is the same thing. We got to realize that no matter where we are, God is going to use Victory Outreach International. You think about the government there in Indonesia. Our recovery homes are, are widely and accepted by the government of Indonesia. The third largest Muslim country in all the world has said, listen, we don't know what to do with all these drug addicts. We don't have the answer. And we, it's okay. We know that you're a Christian ministry, but we want you to stay here. We want you to do what you need to do because we need help for the drug addicts. So they're willing to overlook the fact that we're actually preaching Jesus instead of Allah. They're willing to accept the fact that, listen, hey, yeah, you used to be a drug addict, and we're going to give you a visa to come into our country and do what you need to do because we have a problem. How many know that there are more countries there in Asia that have a problem? They have a big problem. When it comes to the sex slavery trade, listen, my friend, you haven't seen nothing yet here in America because when you go to countries there in Vietnam and in, in Thailand, you're going to see that in the culture that when they have children that are girls, they are rejoicing why so that they know that that girl's going to raise up and be, make them money for the family that's the mentality 
They, the, the people will rejoice when you have a daughter. The mothers will raise their daughters not, and, try, and do their best not to be emotionally connected for the sake that, listen, someday this girl's going to go to the big city and work in the beer house to raise money for our family. That's the alarming reality. And I can go on and on. we got cities all across the Philippines that we haven't yet even gone to and shared their gospel with. Where they have big compounds where young kids and women are locked up in rooms to where they ha- they're there as slaves. And they have no choice. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But that's why God began to anoint Paul for that time. And God said, and Paul even said to God, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do here. These people are kind of loco loco for me. Hello, somebody. They're a little weird. They're a little strange. I don't know what to say to them. But God told him, listen, Paul, you need to stay right where you're at because I have many people in this city. There's a lot of people out there still waiting for us to go and to answer the call of God. There's a lot of people out there. The need is great. Now, not all of us in this room is going to go. Can I get an amen? But I want to encourage you, stretch your faith now because it's, it's through the works of faith that we begin to, begin to see that, listen, God will begin to put an anointing on our life when you start exercising faith in your own family. Hello, somebody. Where you start exercising in your own life, where you start challenging yourself to put your hands to the plow and open your home for a life group or, or open up your life to welcome people in and sit down at your dinner table just so you can encourage them and love them. Can I get an amen? This was the lifestyle of the early believers. Listen, not all of them were called to go and preach like Paul but there were many who would entertain those who were passing through many of those were entertained those who were just new converts in Christianity many of those who were who had nothing to eat but yet the believers what they would do was they would give up all they could to go ahead and make sure that everybody was okay you see it in the book of Acts the believers had everything in common and they sold everything so that nobody had need hello somebody There was no separation. There was no, you know, I'm better than you kind of attitude. Or, you know what, look at you and and look down upon you. When you walked in the church, no, it was like everybody was the same. Because they said, listen, God is not a respecter of persons. So why should we be that kind of church? Why should we be that kind of people? Listen, Jesus Christ died. And it was fresh in their minds. It was something that just happened. And they just experienced the, the power and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came on the scene. And when they became spirit filled they did not care about their belongings they did not care about the material things of life all they cared about was spreading the gospel loving those that came to the household of faith and taking care of their needs I'm a missionary, so I'm going to tell it like it is can I get an amen if I can I'll talk you into selling your house for the sake of the gospel <laughs> don't go there Christian all right praise the Lord Talk about my money. It ain't funny. But every day conversation in this city was filthy, cursing, slander, lovers of money, gamblers. Imagine you come in weakness and in fear and much trembling. You know, a good, you know, Christian now serving God for a number of years. You come to a city or country. You're not really familiar with the people or the language or the culture. What happens is God begins to open your senses. All of a sudden, you're a lot more perceptive. You listen a little better. All of a sudden, things become a little more real. Hello, somebody. You're a lot more aware of the need of the people. Why? Because you're trying to open your eyes to be able to understand the need and understand the people and understand the culture as much as you can. And what happens is the Holy Spirit begins to give you an anointing so that when you're talking to people, all of a sudden you're speaking a different language and you're not sure exactly how you're ministering. But how many know the Holy Spirit, when He's upon your life, that He gives you the words to say, He gives you the things that you need to do, and He begins to speak into your heart. So why? That you can begin to be an ambassador 
ambassador for Jesus Christ. Listen, you're looking at somebody who never graduated high school. Hello, somebody. I was a high school dropout. Why? Because I dropped high school to sell drugs full time with my mother who was a drug addict as well. And how many know that now here I am standing before you. I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I am a man who has continued to lay down his life. And I am God who I, I get on the airplane and I start traveling to places. And, I, and even in my own city, the mayor's office is, has an open door policy. Anytime I need anything, hello somebody, I just come and I say, listen, we need help. We need to be able to open this place up. Right now, we're getting ready to open a children's home. The city government there in the nation of the Philippines is waiting for me to make a proposal where they will provide the venue, but we will provide the workers who will love those children. How many can say amen? Because they see the genuine love that we're there. We're not there to gain something. We're not there to, to make something. We're not there for ourselves, but there, we're there for the Filipino people. And they recognize that. Can I give, give the Lord a hand tonight, today? This is why the Bible says God will call the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. This is why God begins to say, listen, I'm going to bring somebody who was a nobody and make them somebody who will begin to reach the somebodies. Sometimes you'll be in a situation where you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to act. You don't know what, to, but you got to just allow the Holy Spirit to bring you. Even Paul was there. And he was able to be a vessel where he connected with the other believers in that city. And he worked to take care of his own self. He worked. He didn't walk with his hand out. Right now, I'm excited and I'm grateful for what God is doing on our ministry there. More than seven years ago when the Lord had stopped everything coming in from outside, it was God's way of setting up our church to where they would begin to transition from a third world mentality to a kingdom mentality. And today, more than seven years later, we are operating at the same budget we were then when we had money coming from the United States and, and money coming from the mayor's office. Today, it's all from the church, the people of God that God is raising up there in the city of San Pedro. Can I get an amen? God is raising up tithers and givers and men and women who want to answer the call. And they're doing it not because, listen, it's the popular thing to do, but they're doing it because they're receiving such a conviction in their heart that, listen, the Filipino is worth dying for. Can I get an amen? That they're willing to say, listen, no matter what, this vision that God has given to our founder, this vision, listen, it's our vision. And we need to start seeing that God can provide just as much as he blesses our brothers and sisters in America. God can provide for the Filipinos as well. Can I get an amen? And their mentality is, listen, we have a four-year-old little girl who lives with us there. And the government has brought her to us to rescue them, to help them. And listen, this little four-year-old girl, she doesn't make excuses why she can't go do evangelism she goes out with the women's home and she Three starts outreach will love me and she's telling them she's sharing the good news she's testifying a four-year-old little girl come on now how much more are those of us who got a testimony to talk about we can't go to the streets because we're too busy we can't go and tell our co-workers about Jesus because we're afraid we might get in trouble. Listen, I've been there. But I'll tell you, I didn't let it keep me quiet. I was working before we went to pastor. I was working at a full-time job. God gave me that job, and I had no experience. Can I get an amen? How many know what I'm talking about? Came back from Manila back then, and all of a sudden I told Pastor Steve, I need to get a job. I left to visit my family. I came back and I had a job over the weekend starting at $16 an hour. This was about 15 years ago. Hello, full benefits. And I had no experience. Plus, I can bring the homes into work in my department anytime I needed them. Hello, somebody. Yeah. So if I was going to try to be shy about the gospel, the men's home would expose me anyways. Praise the Lord. 
But I remember there was times where there was one lady in our church there. Her daughter worked in my department. I was a supervisor. And, and all of a sudden, man, she was getting so bitter. I don't know why. But all of a sudden, one day I wake up real early. I go to work. She starts making all these different articles and stuff, trying to blaspheme against my faith and my, my founders. Talk about me all you want. It's okay. But don't talk about Pastor Sonny. Hello, those are fighting words. Hello, come on. So, of course, I had to exercise a little humility. But my humility in the end paid off to where I had the respect of all the people in the company. And through that, God began to open doors. And right after that, then they asked us to go be pastors. You see, your own personal trials and testing that you go through here at home. If you, if you embrace them the way the gospel tells you to embrace them, trust me, my friend. You never know what God's going to do next. You never know what's going to happen next. You see, we got to realize that the word of God is living. The word of God is alive. It's not a, it's not a dead gospel. It's just not another book of knowledge and wisdom. But it's a living word. Changed my life. It did. It changed my life so much that, listen, when the gospel, when I would read the Bible to somebody who couldn't read, all of a sudden this big macho biker guy could not read, and he asked me to read it, and I read it to him. All of a sudden he started weeping and crying right there in the middle of the jail cell. Hello, somebody. How I many know you don't do that in jail? But he could not hold it back because why? And I said, why? Are, what's wrong with you? He said, I've never heard this before. I've never been able to read this before. But it's hitting. It's touching me. It's moving in my heart. You know, the gospel is powerful. It is living. It is effective. And the Bible says that the gospel should be the light upon our path, not our wisdom, not our understanding, not our ways. But how many know God's ways are the best ways? And that's exactly how we continue to do. My wife and I, when we had nobody to call on, nobody to look to because our pastor was already with the Lord. Hello, somebody. When we had nothing but Jesus Christ, when we had nothing but each other, all we could do is get on our knees and pray for the next provision, pray for the wisdom, pray how, to, how are we going to pastor the people. Well, I don't know. We're just going to have to trust God and believe God. And how many know when the Lord builds the house, the laborers will not labor in vain. The house of God there in the Philippines will not be shaking ever again. The men and women that God is raising up in the Philippines, they're not going to be scattered anymore because God is building a household of faith right there where they're believing God and trusting God and giving to God. And how many know that those are the future pastors and evangelists of the ministry? Why? Because they're being raised on how to believe God for their next meal. How to believe God for things that are going to happen. They're not giving, being given everything on a silver platter anymore. No, they have to trust in their God. And their God is continuously providing. You see, I can tell you right now just two ways. God, man, started to elevate and build their faith. They started to see how God supernaturally provided. You see, when you serve God and you begin to allow the river to flow... Just like it says in Ezekiel, the river becomes a place where there will be all kinds of animals and fish. To me, what that says to me is there's going to be all kinds of different people coming. There's going to be all kinds of life inside of the river. And it even said that it will make the Dead Sea have life. If you know anything about the Dead Sea, it's dead for a reason. The reason why it's considered the Dead Sea is it's too salty. There's no life in the Dead Sea. There's no fish. There's no animals. There's no life. There's no plantation. Why? Because there's too much salt in it to where the water is so thick and dense that nothing can live in it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. But why is it like that? Why is it so salty? Why is it that, it, that, that, that all this salt has collected in there? It's because all the water flows into it, but there's no outlet. There's no way for the water to flow through. It just flows in, collects, and becomes very salty. I don't know if you've ever been in the Bay Area, but you go right there near the bay, there's what you call the salt flats. It's a lot of dead water. Dead. Why? Because there's so much salt from the ocean that collects right there. This is exactly what happens. Why? Because there's no outlet. A lot of believers are like that. They're too salty for their own good. Can I preach it now? 
Hey, I only, I only preach to you what God shows me first. I ain't going to tell you to do something I ain't living myself. But a lot of believers are so salty that they're useless. They're useless. They have no outlet. Just getting the word every Sunday, going to life group, getting the word. Hello, going to Bible school, college, and everything else, getting the word. But there's no outlet, no life, giving life to others. How many, ooh, it got quiet in here, man. This was the challenge in the mighty men of valor. This was the challenge. I don't know if you men who went caught it, but our founders and pastors were challenging mostly the pastors and churches. Saying, you know what? You know why your church is not growing? You know why you're not getting, you know, a bigger church and more souls? It's because you're just focused on building your church. And you haven't allowed there to be an outlet to the international. You're experiencing new life in this church. How many can say amen? Yes. The new life is a result of having an outlet to the Philippines. That's the reality of it. Your outlet into the international. Your outlet to give life here in your city. The evangelism that you continue to do. The different th outreaches you continue to do. You see, don't focus on just, you know, me, 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 me. As a believer, that can be dangerous and become very detrimental because what happens is, Jesus said, listen, in John 10, 10, he said, I came to give life, but I also came to give life abundantly. There are those who are just serving life in tr Christianity. Lifers. Hello, somebody. Those that are just lifers, doing life in Christianity. But then there are those that step into the life abundantly part. Those that are learn, listen, the principle of God's gospel is, listen, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to share than to keep it all to myself. Listen, what good is it to have all of the knowledge if you're not able to share it in the simple gospel like Paul? Paul brought the simple gospel. He had the knowledge. He had the schooling. He had all of that. But guess what? God has still called him to go ahead and preach to the Gentiles. He couldn't go talk to the Gentiles with all these big religious words, hallelujah, praise the Lord, God is an omnipotent, you know, omniscient God. What? No. The simple demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of the love of Jesus Christ. Let there be an outlet in your life. God has called us to be in the house of God so that we can begin also to flow life to others, give life to others. That's what Victory Outreach is about. That's what we do. We don't believe in keeping it all to ourselves. How many can say amen? amen? And because of that, God is blessing many of the ministries and churches that God has opened the outlet to the international, to other parts of the world. Those are the churches getting blessed in all areas of life. Can I get an amen? amen. How do you think that we are able to pay the bills? We fly back and forth every year. Hello, somebody. Our daughter is in a, one of the best schools in the city. Hello, somebody. The tuition has continued to be paid cash. Can I get an amen? amen. Not by installment. Hello, somebody. And I am not getting thinner every year. <laughs> they don't, I'm getting into the danger zone where I can't buy barones in my size anymore. It's all right, you can laugh, it's true. But the truth is, is listen, why? Because even in our church, we've realized it's not about just receiving. The people of God are learning that it's more blessed to give, to give, to give. Let there be a flow of life out of your life. What will happen is God will bring people into your life who will start to drink from the wellspring of life in your life. All of a sudden, you're going to be a life giver. You're going to be an encourager. All of a sudden, people will start surrounding you and coming to you and, and doing things because, listen, you're giving them something that nobody in the natural can give them. Can I get an amen? amen. We got to realize, though, you got to dig deep in your Christian life. Why? So that you can have a reservoir of the anointing in your life.
Because how many know there's going to be seasons where it's going to feel like, man, I'm dry. I, I, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm giving and giving and giving. But I don't see the, you know why? It's because we're not digging deeper in our Christian life. Digging deeper, allowing the, the, the water of the Holy Spirit's anointing as it flows through our life. It doesn't just flow through. It also goes down into the depth of our heart, in the depth of our life. And what happens is all of a sudden you're able to minister and see signs, miracles, and wonders. He, people will be healed from cancer or diabetes. People will come from their sick bed. When the doctor's telling them, listen, you have three days to live. And you and go ahead and you believe God for a miracle. And three days later, they're checking out of the hospital. I'm only telling you a gospel that we experience and we see firsthand, my friend, where you can have people come and they have all kinds of spiritual influences in their life where they're so supernaturally demonic in, in their life. But how many know with the anointing of God, the Bible says the anointing is, is used for the break the yokes of the enemy. A supernatural warfare. Listen, you are God's chosen people. You are God's vessels. Where He said, all authority has been given to me. Now, therefore, go into all the nations and preach the gospel and make disciples. You see, we begin to receive authority when we start to answer God's great commission to go ahead and give life to the nations. It's the principle. And it's exactly what the gospel tells us. We got to realize that today... We have the Lord's presence in our life, the Lord's protection, and we have each other. United we can. United we can do this. If you're not the one that's being sent out, be the one that sends out. But nevertheless, the Bible says in Romans, there are those that are sent and there are those who do the sending. God will begin to open the channel more wider you see, the more you start removing the stones that are blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life, the, the stones of doubt, the stones of fear, the st stones of insecurity, the stones of I don't think I can do it, I don't think I can afford it, I don't have the time, start removing those stones. And what happens is the channel of God's Holy Spirit begins to open wider. And what happens is then you start seeing the supernatural provision in God's, of God in your life. we got to remember... God has called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He has promised to us in the verses that I will go before you. God is with you. God is with you. He even told the disciples that when he commissioned them, he said, Go in the authority I'm giving you. Lo and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Wake up every morning and say, God is with me. Wake up with the morning with an attitude of victory. God is with me. Whatever the enemy, whatever happens today, God is with me. God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. God is with me. God was with Daniel in the lion's den. God is with me. No matter what you go through, where you're going through, hello somebody, God is with you. Remember that God goes with you. He goes before you. He has promised you and I the treasures out of darkness. Let us understand that these are the promises of God for us today. And God blesses your family. My mother was a dope fiend drug addict for many years. And when I was in Dublin, Ireland, just answering God's call, God healed her and set her free. Hershey's father came in the home in the Manila, and look what God has done in his life. She probably wouldn't be here, married to Brother Neil, who looks so guapo today, if it wasn't for what God did in her father's life so many years ago. Let us not forget and understand that God is rich and powerful in all of his wisdom. And he knows what he's doing because God is with you. Every head bowed and every eye closed.